Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Ratner. Today, I'm going to be meeting with Dan Buglio, a mind-body coach and aspiring author. You can check out Dan's daily videos on his YouTube page, www.youtube.com forward slash pain for you. We're going to talk about his journey through 13 years of lower back pain and into helping others manage their thinking to escape fear. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, and put your comments below. Well, I'm here with Dan Buglio. Welcome to the show. I really appreciate you coming on. I try to get um, some of the very best people from the from the mind body field, and your name keeps popping up. There's a lot of people who think very highly of your work, and I couldn't not reach out and find out what it is that you have been doing. So, Dan, can you? One of the places that I always like to begin is how did you come upon these ideas? And and I know enough about you having talked to you now that it came through your own symptoms. And that is very typically the case in, in our work. So mm -hmm. take us through how your symptoms began and what that was like. I was in my early 30s, stressful life, um, bent over to put on my underwear of all things and got a jolt <laughs> of pain in my back. And that one simple, stupid, embarrassing experience led to 13 long years of chronic back pain, sciatica, a body that got twisted all up, uh, very well jacked up over the years from uh, muscle imbalances caused by compensating for the pain. Um, and at some point in that process, I heard Howard Stern talking about this guy, Dr. John Sarno, who saved Howard Stern's life. and said, all right, let me get the books. And within the first year of learning about Dr. Sarno, I had some good results, but then pain came back and then went away again, then came back and on and off it went for a lot of time. And then it just stayed on. And no matter what I knew about this mind body stuff, I was kind of stuck. And I rode that for 12 years worth of chronic pain, even after I heard about the mind body stuff. So the first thing I want to say is it's not going to take anybody 12 years to get better because there's so much more information out now than there was in the 90s when I first figured out about it. Because I was going yeah. through before Facebook, YouTube, podcasts, and anything. So you guys have the cheat sheets. There's tons of information. How how uh, what year was it that you that you finally got to, you know pain free? Uh, 11 years ago. So what does that put us at? Around 2009 ish ballpark. And I was not great at documenting this stuff. So I'm estimating roughly with the years, but right. I was in pain for roughly 13 years. Uh, been pain free for just about 11 now. And so, you know, if people say, does this stuff really work? Can you get out of pain permanently? My answer is, yeah. I mean, I think 11 years is a pretty good track record after 13 years of hurting. Yeah, and you and I actually have some similarities. Uh, mine did not come from putting on underwear, but I was tying my shoes. That, that, that's Equally where it came embarrassing. From. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's really dangerous. So you know, you got to watch those shoes because you were bending over real probably careful. farther than I did. So that's right. That's it's right. So we're, you know, we could we could just recommend just don't put on underwear and you'll be fine. And don't tie <laughs> your shoes. Get the Velcro Absolutely. or slip-ons. So, but the reality is, I think that's such an important observation. We had such a small thing that happened and it spiraled into this larger thing. And that's what, that's what we find out in listening to chronic pain sufferers all the time. It started off with a little thing and it becomes very scary because we don't know why it's happening. Mm -hmm. We don't know what to do about it. Now, I will say this. One thing that I envy you a little bit about, which is a funny thing to say for someone who actually had pain longer than I did. Um, is that you discovered Sarno earlier in the process. For some reason, it took me eight years to find Sarno. And mm -hmm. then there was probably about a year afterwards that I had to kind of work at things better. And I, I'm still working day to day. How did you discover Sarno? Uh, Howard Stern, talking on his radio show, mentioned how this guy, Dr. John Sarno, saved his life. And how, uh, you know, Howard was so disabled that at times he would lay on the floor in his radio studio with the microphone dangling in his face um, and conducting his show that way. Not all the time, but enough times. And then, uh, you know, he met Dr. Sarno and Sarno was in New York. Howard was in New York. So Sarno kind of cured him 
And then Howard got a regular life where he'd go running for five miles and everything was good. So I said, yeah. who the heck is this guy? I got to get John Sarno's book. Got to, you know, bookstore and uh, found healing back pain. And that started my journey with this whole mind body concept. And that was 23 years ago, somewhere around there. And been how jarring was it? By it. Go ahead. Yeah, how jarring was it for you? I mean, uh, you know, I come from a family of therapists. I knew about psychosomatic issues, although I misunderstood them. I thought they were in your head, but mm -hmm. actually they're, they start in your head, but they're real in your body. So even I had a misunderstanding about that, but I felt like I had a head start on that. But what was it like for you to come across that idea? You know, I was, for some reason, I was not extremely resistant to it. I guess the way Howard told the story and he told how bad his pain was and how, you know, how this knowledge and the insight that his body wasn't really the problem and it had to do with a lot of stress and tension and in his case, you know, a lot of negative emotions. And um, yeah, I guess I just kind of bought into it fairly quickly. I don't remember resisting it a lot. And within, mm -hmm. you know, a month or two of reading the book the first time, I felt better problem was a month or two later it hit me again and then that time i was like well what's going on i thought i was good and then it took longer to get rid of it and then up and down and up and down and after a while i just got more and more and more frustrated because i'm like but i know what's going on why can i not get rid of this and keep it away and invariably um that was my journey for a long time and after a while it just became stuck and chronic and persistent. So I want to get to that, that 12 year journey before we go there though, I wanted to hear about that first year and what kind of thoughts and feelings you had during that time. I don't know how well you remember it. Yeah. Complete confusion. Not sure what the heck was going on because after hurting my back, putting my underwear on, um, three days later, I'm like, getting in the car my wife's driving me to the chiropractor and i don't know about you but if you've had back spasms nothing feels better than having a chiropractor try to twist your back while you're in complete spasm it was torture and yeah. you know i could barely get in the car getting out of there um so it was brutal the the muscle relaxers didn't work the chiropractor didn't work i found a different chiropractor at least he kind of greased the skids a little bit with the electronic stimulators and it kind of warmed up the muscles and I would feel okay for like an hour after the appointment, but then afterwards it would just go right back into spasm. And, you know, I'd stay that way until next week when I went back to the chiropractor again. And so there was a lot of uncertainty, fear. The muscle relaxants didn't do a damn thing to touch it. Never went on heavy pain meds. Um, I guess I just wasn't prescribed them and didn't pursue them diligently. Um, so the first year was just a lot of traditional physical therapy, stretching, chiropractic, and uh, confusion for that matter. This is so this is so familiar to me though because I did have I had daily back spasms. I had spasms that would wake me in the night, and there there is I I would almost take any other physical experience than a back spasm. It just mm -hmm. is like you're being shocked. And then something happens afterwards. It's it's, it's worse than being shocked. Yeah. And I and going to the chiropractor uh -huh. with those was the worst. Yeah. Go ahead. I, you were going to say. Something. I had a Charlie horse. I don't know four or five nights ago, and you've had those where your whole calf muscle just turns rock hard and it oh, seizes, yeah. and you got to like find a way to grab your foot and like stretch it out, and then you're like limping for the rest of the day because it hurts so much. Well, I mean, for anybody who's not had a back spasm, that's what it feels like, but in your lower back for me. And it's yeah. just literally, you know, I had a back spasm that lasted 14 hours and I couldn't get off the floor. And so, and it's crippling because of where it's located on top of it. So, and I'm right there with you. When I went to the chiropractor in those situations, it was even worse. Um, sure. The chiropractor was helpful to me in his mindset in telling me that it could get better. And, and I put all my hopes in him and he was a great chiropractor and he was the one who introduced me to Sarno actually in the end, um, which I appreciate, but that was very hard. So, okay, now let's jump forward to that, that 12 year, 
that 12-year battle where slowly it got worse and worse in a way. Why do you why do you think it did get worse? How do you understand it now? I believe that we have an initial instance of pain and two things make it become persistent or chronic. Fear and attention. And so as my fear that I wasn't going to be able to figure this out, even though I knew about Sarno, which brought my fear way down initially, repetitively having more spasms, more pain, this and that, my fear grew that, okay, I know what it is, but I still can't figure it out. So my fear grew and grew and grew. And the more fear you have, you, you tell me what happens to your pain level goes up, right? And the more mm -hmm. you stare at the symptom, the more persistent it's going to be. Right. So fear and attention are the two things that make something from one instance to become chronic or persistent. So over 12 years, my fear level grew, my ability to divert my attention to something other than the pain became minimized more and more. And my entire life was spent just coping with it, learning to live with it, as people say. And um, everything about it was, oh, you got to cut the lawn. Oh you know, convince my kid to do it, Matt, I'm, I'm hurting today. Can you do that? Or can you get the groceries or can you carry the laundry basket? Ah, oh, I got a bad back, got a bad back. And even though I knew about Sarno and didn't truly believe I had a bad back, my language that I used and even my thoughts were, yeah, I got a bad back. Every time I bend over to pick something up, it, it hurts. And so what was I teaching the brain? Danger. Every time I bent over to pick something up, my brain went, ouch. Don't do that. Are you crazy? You're going to hurt yourself. Don't you remember? You told me 10,000 times you got a bad back. So it was like an up and down journey. And I would go from feeling very confident that I'm fine, no worries, to, oh, my God, I, you know, this is awful. And so I pretty much made every mistake in the book. So for anybody who's saying, oh, my God, it's going to take me 12 years from learning about this stuff to get better. No, you're getting the cheat sheet. <laughs> Between Dan and I and other TMS experts, the process to get better is known. Dr. Sarno, I mean, he's got a 191-page book that's like 189 pages of what this mind-body thing is. He's got like a page and a half of what to do about it. And I was like, I'm doing all that, but I'm still not better, so I must be doing it wrong. And so, of course, I got more and more desperate and full of despair and worried that I'm doing something wrong, so I'm never going to get better. And, of course, add more fear, add more desperation. You stare at the symptoms more. You go through your, your day. You wake up in the morning. You tell me if you've done this, Dan. You wake up in the morning and go, oh, boy, how bad is today going to be? Yeah. Your brain I, goes, let me show you. <laughs> I, used to, I used to wake up every single morning, and the very first thing on my mind was, how's my back? And the very last thing that was on my mind when I went to sleep was, how's my back? It was, it's it was like, it's all and, and so I love what you're saying about it, about fear and attention, because so I, I work uh, with the idea that emotions can cause this and doubt can cause this. And, and what is doubt, doubt, or the questions you have, the confusion and the fear. So we're speaking the same language and this is often the case. TM, TMS or mind body practitioners are often talking about things in a similar way, our own language that we've come to. When you mention attention, though, I think that that sheds some light on something that I was just thinking about, that this is why doubt is so powerful. It, it grabs your attention. You cannot, when you have those questions and you have that fear, when you're afraid, you can't pay attention to other things. You can't. Well, think about what fear is designed to do. It's to keep us safe when, we're, when our life is threatened. If there is a bear in the woods in front of you staring at you growling, you're supposed to be afraid. You're supposed to go into the stress response. There's no way you're going to be able to take your eyes off of that bear. You're not going to go, ah, no big deal and turn your back, right? Fear is supposed to get our attention. So is pain for that matter. It's designed by nature. That's right. To get our attention. But when you don't have an answer or you think you have an answer, but you still can't figure it out, then it's very difficult, like you said, to turn away from it and shift your attention back to living life. So it's right. you compelled and staring at it and the fear just amplifies the need to stare at it. And, you know, I talk a lot about neuroplasticity and the neural pathways. And when you are focused on something intently, like with fear, 
the brain goes, this is important. And it wires mm -hmm. those neural pathways and it keeps it going. So as long as you're staring at it, desperate to fix it, monitoring it, measuring it all day long, those neural pathways are being used. How's the brain going to let go of that? So I think that's really important to understand is that fear and attention are the two things that fuel the chronic symptoms. So if you want to get out, guess what? You know how you got in, so turn around. Let's turn down the fear. Let's take the attention away. Easier said than done, but it truly is that simple. I, I totally agree. And I was going to say a similar thing. If we know that fear and attention causes it, mm -hmm. then if you can take away the fear, or in my case, I talk about it as doubt. Uh, fear is one of those things, one of the doubts. If you take away that doubt and you take away that attention, that's no what's going to reverse it. There's mm -hmm. no fuel at all. That's great. Exactly. And I actually call doubt the fuel. So this is so interesting. We have a lot of overlap and we hadn't talked about that in advance. So I want to jump to one other thing that you said that I think is really important. You said Sarno has a 191 page book, 189 pages are describing what it is, which is extremely useful and extremely important. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure you hear this all the time. How? Everybody wants to know, how do we do this? And this is part of how I developed what I do. I think it's part of how you developed what you do. We know what people want. We know what they need. And they do need to know how. Now, it's not that I'm just going to tell them what to do and they listen and they do it and then it works. They have to engage with it. But it still is about how. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the ultimate goal that we're, that we're striving for. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how you started working with people and how you started to think about the how of it all. So I will tell you, you know, I come from a marketing background and when I first got into this Dr. Sarno thing, all I saw was an opportunity to teach this stuff and make money, honestly. And that sounds like a very shallow money-making angle to this. Um, but I didn't really start doing anything at a serious level. It's probably only in the past six months uh, that I feel like I could actually close down my regular business and have enough income to pay my bills. So trust me, I've been involved in this space for 24 years. I've been coaching for probably five or six years in various levels of seriousness or effectiveness. Um, and I've not to this day until recently felt like I could pay my bills by doing this. So it's always been a matter of passion for me more so than income. Right. And I started shooting these daily videos simply by saying, I'm getting tired of going into these Facebook groups about TMS and answering the same questions over and over and over again and seeing the same people in despair and fear and frustration and not knowing what to do and typing the same answers over and over and over again. And, you know, I was talking to a buddy of mine. He goes, why don't you just shoot, you know, some videos, do like seven days of Facebook live videos on Facebook, see what happens. So I started doing that, and you know, first first time I did it, I might have had like two people show up for the call or the, for the video, and over time, I might have got over the week, I might have gotten a little more. So for the first month, I did Facebook Live videos with my phone, and the quality was awful. I was shooting them out back, so the Wi-Fi was like awful connection. Everything was pixelated. It was really not good. So I finally made the switch to a real camera, and I got to now 1080, you know high definition uh, and it is a lot harder to do that because you have to take the card out and upload it and all that stuff as opposed to saying I'm done with the live publish and I was done so obviously I added to the workflow by going with a, a video camera but um, I was just passionate I wanted to see what would happen and that was March 26th of 2019 well, between the Facebook Live videos and my YouTube channel, I'm probably about 685 videos later every single day without missing a day. And so nearly two years of daily videos. And it's it's been, you said, how did I figure out how to help people? Honestly, yeah. been teaching it every single day for almost two years. Because prior to that, I kind of knew what I had learned. I had gone to a certification program for another TMS expert. And, and I kind of felt like I knew what TMS was, but I didn't really have a program, so to speak. 
And right. so the benefit of me doing these daily videos is that my message has become laser focused on the key essentials of getting well, no extraneous 47 other things. I don't give people a 27 point checklist to do every day. It's like, get these main principles down and you're going to get well. And I know that because I've got thousands of people giving me feedback on all these videos and saying, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm saying, your name doesn't even look familiar. We haven't spoken. But people who have just watched videos and said, I'm getting better. And so my message has become, like I said, laser focused over the past almost two years. And now I can actually say, I know what I'm doing. Before it was like, I can help you point you in the right direction, but I didn't know exactly what to tell people to do. So the how, we talked about this earlier, how do you get this done um, is much more focused for me now. And I, I, don't I think it's a great they, point. I don't believe it's a healing process because if you buy into this mind-body concept and what Sarno taught, because anything that they find medically is a incidental finding there's nothing actually wrong with your body so there's nothing to heal so to me it's not healing it's actually teaching the brain to settle down your nervous system and so i think that's a great that, yeah it's yeah it's deep. a great way of putting it um because i always do think when people use the language injuries and things like that i say hey wait a minute what are you what are you saying to yourself there and yeah. i and I, I really didn't think about this but the word healing as great as it is i i think it i agree with you in that i think it's really about the information and maybe taking control of the of your your mental apparatus taking control right. of how you're you're seeing it i also really agree with this idea that the longer i've taught this the more honed it's all become and oh. that happened even today I was working with somebody today. I was telling them about a certain thing and I was like, oh, you know what? This needs to be even more front and center in this part of things. It reminds me of how when we were talking, um, so, you know, Dan and I are both writing books. We've both been writing books for a long time. And I made this joke earlier that my book keeps getting better and better the longer I don't publish it because I just keep learning more. And you're right. We learn from the people we're working with in large measure. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly learned from myself as well. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I will find that I'll go out with like a three-word topic and nothing else prepared. And in the middle of that video, out of the ether just comes an analogy that helps explain the concept in such a way that makes it so easy to understand. And so I've developed dozens of analogies over the past two years that are all very useful in helping people to gather or, or grasp the concepts that I'm sharing. And so the more you teach it, the better you are. It's like, if you want to learn something, study it. If you want to really learn something, teach it. Mm -hmm. Because you can't teach it until you've really gotten it deep. So this practice of daily teaching, in my mind, I've learned more in the past two years than I did in the prior 20. I think that's fantastic. I did strong. wonder. And you're going to do the same. You're on an accelerated learning and teaching schedule now that you're doing your work that will accelerate you. Look at Eddie, Eddie Lindenstein. He was doing a podcast. He's now a couple of years into it, a weekly podcast. Eddie's gone from a guy who had TMS to one of the experts simply mm -hmm. by surrounding himself with these experts and needing to teach it every week. And so that's how we do it. And it, it, I mean, it's great. You're on that same path. And like you said, you're becoming more and more laser focused on the important stuff and you're letting some of the ancillary stuff it, drop by the wayside. It really is a fantastic way of looking at it. And I think it's so right on. Um, I, you know, I think I've been writing a book all these years, but what I've really been doing is teaching myself by preparing to write this book or, but I mean, I have, I've written three quarters of it and then I actually wrote a whole book and then I decided to change it. But essentially what I was doing was learning. So I wondered, could you, if you had to offer just a couple of thoughts, um, you know, let's say, I mean, I hate to do the whole elevator pitch kind of thing, uh, put you on the spot that way, but I do, I wonder if you could just give two or three ideas that are pretty central to how you work with people, what would you say? Well, 
I think over the past several months, I've gotten much more clarity that people need to understand the system. When I say the system, I mean what TMS is, the stress response, how the brain works, how pain works, what's the purpose of pain in the first place, how things become chronic, fear and attention, you know, neuroplasticity, how the brain wires, what the brain's job is to keep you safe and alive. Once you understand the system, then the path to teaching the system to calm down, you're actually not broken, becomes much more clear to me. And so when I coach with somebody, the first 45 minutes, sometimes hour is spent on how did we get here, right? Literally just spoke to somebody who, you know, was raised by somebody who was always saying, be careful, be careful, be careful. You're going to hurt yourself, going to hurt you. And so what do you think this girl's nervous system did? Kept on ratcheting up. And so later in life, as the stressors, the tensions, the fears got bigger and bigger, I think the nervous system kind of overflows and we get symptoms. Is it Sarno's emotional experience thing? You know, the uh, emotional repressed emotions? Maybe. Or is it the nervous system just becoming more and more highly sensitized and symptoms start, but then we get medicalized by a medical system that doesn't know how to stop chronic pain. And that's another trauma and our nervous system just keeps on ratcheting up. And so understanding this, the system and how we got here is so important because once you understand that you just have a nervous system and a brain that is in hyper protective mode and everything is perceived as danger, well, it becomes pretty clear. We need to turn down the fear, which is one of the two fuels. And mm -hmm. we do that through things like accurate knowledge an assessment that says, yes, this is what's going on for me. And then doing other things that will soothe the nervous system and calm the brain. So yes, feel your emotions, but I don't tell you to go dig up, you know, decades old traumas. I say, feel your right now emotions to teach your brain that even current emotions are safe. Feel your, or, or soothe your body. So get out of the stress response. If you find yourself all wired and tense, breathe. You got to calm down your thinking. And we touched on this before we went live here, but you don't have to believe your thoughts. You don't have to change them. You don't have to stop thinking negatively. You don't have to only have positive thoughts to get better because that's virtually impossible. So like, okay, so calm down your thinking. What does that look like? It means, oh, I had a really dark, scary thought. You don't have to believe it. That's not necessarily true. And it's certainly not helpful. So I'm going to let that one float by because I got another 70,000 today that are coming my way. Thoughts are just thoughts. They don't mean anything. So why do we hang on to the dark, scary ones and let the gratitude and the life is beautiful? Oh, look at the sunrise. And we let all that stuff float by like it's nothing. And we grab onto the negative. And so the last thing I talk about is mindset, the mindset of indifference, truly saying, I don't care about the symptoms. And people will always say, how can you not care? It hurts so bad. That's right. the thing I get the most push pushback on. And so the, the gold standard is completely authentically not caring if you hurt or not, which is really hard to get to. The opposite side of that spectrum is completely freaking out. Yeah. And nobody I ever met, spoke to, heard of, ever got better by freaking out. Why? <laughs> because if the system is designed to, you know, turn up the pain when we're in danger, freaking out just screams to the brain, we're in danger. You're amplifying your nervous system, the adrenaline, the cortisol, the heart rate, the blood pressure, everything goes up. And so if you're freaking out, you're not going to get better. So if you can't be indifferent, at least don't freak out. And the middle ground is reassure yourself, remind yourself of the accurate knowledge called mind-body syndrome, TMS. And it's okay. Like, Dan, you're going to be good. You got this. Literally, chill out. You're going to be all right. Trust me. How do we say that? because we already know how the system works and calming down the system is the answer. And that's why the things that I just literally ran through in the past three, four minutes is what we do to calm down the system. Yeah. I mean, I shift our attention away from the symptoms and the pains, which further teaches the brain, well, look, he's not staring at this anymore. So I guess those symptoms really aren't dangerous, right? Everything that I just ran through are all messages of safety. So that's like yeah. the quick three-minute 
blast through or five minute blast through. But um, it's really a matter you did of great with it. understand the system and then teach, don't heal the system, teach the system to calm down. But let me let me end on a, just two different notes. One, I, I want to highlight that in some ways what you're saying um, there is that when you understand things, you will calm down. Sure. If you don't know what's going on, you're, there's no way in heck you're going to calm I, down. Because all you do is freak out because you don't understand why you're feeling the way you do. But the combination between that and one other thing I think is useful, and I don't know if you'll agree with this, and maybe we'll, we could have you back on to have this debate or discussion. I've come to see that these things can change very quickly. Now, I'm not saying that to say, hey, if they're not changing very quickly, something's wrong. I'm just aware that we are these emotional and cognitive beings, and our thoughts are changing all the time, and our emotions are changing all the time. And as a result, our bodies would also be changing all the time. Mm-hmm. If we weren't locked into fear, sure. if we, if we aren't locked into fear, your body would change also. And so we can learn to shift these things more, but it comes through the understanding. And so I, I love talking to people like you in the field because I hear my language spoke. It's like a related language. It's like, I'm speaking Italian, you're speaking Spanish. And I'm like, I hear a lot of similarities. Um, and I can tell why people have raved about you. Um, you you have a, a calm way of looking at it, and you have very helpful and, and incisive ideas. And I just look forward to seeing where our two journeys go as we try to help as many people as we can. And I want to thank you for coming on, Dan. Well, I appreciate you bringing me on. I look forward to you sending me the link so I can share it with my community. And I look forward to... You know, maybe doing this again when I launch my podcast later in the year, I'll bring you on my side too. Please do. I would love to come on. So I was really excited to have Dan on our show. And one of the reasons was the kind of rave reviews I have heard from other people about the work that he's done uh, with them. And I, I did find in talking to him that there are some huge similarities in the way that we think. Uh, some differences, but uh, most of them are kind of more about how we're describing the same thing that we're seeing. And one of the things I really like about Dan is that he is all about how your thinking leads to fear or not, and how that can change your physiology. It's very similar to my thoughts about doubt. In fact, fear is one of the things that I list in doubt. To me, fear is the emotional form of doubt. And it really is true that if you can reduce that doubt, or in in Dan's case, fear, um, that you change your physiology, you relax, and you can get to a pain-free place. So on his site, uh, at his YouTube station, Pain Free Now, that's what he's promoting, and it's a very similar thing to what I'm thinking. So I also was really fascinated by this one observation that he made, that it's fear and attention that leads to symptoms in his mind. Now, I don't disagree with that. I just have a different way of looking at it. Um, Of course, as we know, anybody who has watched me knows, I have the three different columns. I have emotions, I have doubt, and I have power. These are the things that are kind of the the levers that can either lead to symptoms or bring them down. But I did think it was important to think about the fact that attention uh, is another way of looking at the same thing that I'm talking about when I'm talking about doubt. When you are afraid and when you have doubt, it's very hard to pay attention to anything else. And it's also very hard to get your attention off of it if you don't have any reason to believe that you have nothing to fear. So we keep cycling through the fear over and over and over. And that's how we renew the proverbial subscription to pain. If you want to get rid of that pain, we have to bring the fear down, at least in given moments, so that you can start to see the difference between when you're afraid and when you're not. Another thing that really jumped out at me about this interview with Dan is how much both of us realize that we have been learning through teaching. And that includes the books we're writing. We're both writing books. We've been writing them for a long time. As I said, my book is getting better and better, but it hasn't come out yet. And I really want to get it out to you all. So I'm very close to finished with it, but I have to say it's a much better book than it would have been if I had published it two years ago. Dan's finding the same thing but I'm also finding that 
the more teaching I do, the more I'm learning about this process and the more something hits me and I think, ah, that's important. Like just today when I was talking to Dan and he mentioned attention, I was like, ah, that's another way of explaining the same situation. And the more knowledge I have in that way, the more I can help other people. The other thing that struck me is just how much people need these resources. So Dan's been putting out daily videos. We just started putting out our everyday videos in the week, five days a week. And it does seem like people are really gravitating towards that. And I can understand why, because the pain sufferers out there so much need the input and the support and the information. And it's a pleasure to connect with people like Dan and to continue to network because I think the more the mind-body community is together and, and knows each other and helps to support each other, the more the message gets out there. So I wanted to thank you all for watching. This show is nothing without you. We need to be supporting you and helping you find ways through your pain into a better life. And that's our goal. And I really appreciate you watching and tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you next time.